In this video I'm going to teach you how to master the questions on the diffraction grating practical, which is a core practical in all of the three major examples. Essentially what we're trying to do is trying to measure the wavelength of light, and we're putting together this idea of path difference, phase difference and interference patterns. If you haven't seen my videos on those concepts, I suggest you go back and look at those before you look at this video, because this video is just about the practical to measure the wavelength of light. This is the diffraction grating practical, and in other words, it's a practical that we can use to measure the wavelength of light. Edexo, OCR, and AK all have it in their CPAC, and it will come up in the exams as well. This is the names of those in different specifications. But essentially, it's the same practical. It's a really tricky one, and I know a lot of people struggle with it at first glance because it's putting together a lot of hard ideas into a really tricky practical. But focus when you're doing practicals, when you're learning that, on memorizing the method and knowing how to be accurate and how to do the analysis afterwards. Essentially, you're just taking laser light and you're trying to shine that through a diffraction grating and you're analyzing the interference pattern that's produced on a screen. You use trigonometry to work out the angles between the zero order maximum and the subsequent maxima. Then use this equation, n lambda equals d sine theta, to work out the wavelength of the laser light. Laser light is in the order of hundreds of nanometers. Visible light is in the order of hundreds of nanometers, so you need to be incredibly accurate to get a really accurate value for that. There's two ways to be accurate, and if you think about percentage uncertainty, you should always think about either reducing your actual uncertainty, which is given by the scale on the instrument that you're using, or by increasing the actual size of the thing you're trying to measure. And I've been most accurate when I've actually done this in the sport hall, and I've actually used about 40 meters as being the distance between the grating and the screen. But this all goes back to the idea of path difference and phase difference. Those bright points are points where the path difference is a multiple of the wavelength, so the laser light is arriving in phase at those points. So you're getting constructive interference, and so you get a bright spot. This is Gorilla Physics, and other channels they cover the content, but I'm going to show you how to get the A star. I'm going to show you how to master this practical today. I'm going to show you how to master this practical. If you want a summary of all of the practicals, then I have a video for each of the three main exam boards where I go through every single practical in one video. And I have really in detail descriptions of all the practicals, including how they're analysed and how you can evaluate them. So check out my practicals playlist. This is the basic method. You shine a laser through a diffraction grating, and this is what the students are doing here. You measure the distance between the grating and the wall, and also the distance between the maxima, which are the bright spots on the wall or a screen. And you use trigonometry to work out an angle between the zero order, which was straight through the path of the laser if it hadn't gone through the diffraction grating. You use trigonometry to work out an angle between the zero order and the maximas. This is a diagram in a bit more detail. You use a diffraction grating to produce what we call an interference pattern. Now, I strongly suggest if you haven't already seen my video on path difference versus phase difference, because that's a key principle in this practical, and also interference patterns, then watch that first, because this video is all about the practical rather than the theory of interference. You're probably going to use a meter ruler to measure the distance between the diffraction grating and the screen. That's labeled as length D here on the diagram. And if you were using a length that was longer than a meter, then you wouldn't use a meter ruler. You'd probably use a tape measure. There is a real issue in this practical around do you want the distances to be as large as possible or do you prefer to use instruments with scales as small as possible? As with all practicals, there's an idea of percentage uncertainty that keeps coming back in every single practical. When we're trying to get as accurate as possible, we're trying to think about reducing our percentage uncertainty to make that as small as possible by either making the value of the thing we're measuring much bigger or the scale of what we're measuring with much smaller. Then we use the distances, and I've labeled them as H1 and H2 on this graph, between zero, which is the path straight on of the laser, and the first order, then the second order, and also the distance to the third order as well, to work out a series of angles. We're then going to use the equation n lambda, and lambda is our target, lambda is our wavelength of the light, is equal to d, and d is the slit separation given on the diffraction grating, multiplied by sine theta. And theta is an angle that you've worked out with trig. So here's all the equations that you need. So here's the setup, and this is a top-down view. This is our diffraction grating here, we've got a laser, and we get this diffraction and this interference pattern on the screen here. Where the screen hits, that's where we've got our bright dots, our bright fringes, if you like. This is our zero order. This is the brightest dot on the screen, and it'll be straight on through the path of the laser. The distance between the diffraction grating and the screen is distance d, and the distance between the zero order and each maxima are given by h1 and h2, and you'd have h3 as well. So the first thing to do is to use trigonometry to work out the angle, and that's given by tan to the minus 1, the distance between the zero and the maxima you're talking about, over D, which is the distance from the diffraction grating to the screen, and that gives you the angle phi. Then you use that in N, which is 
the which order are you talking about multiplied by lambda which is the wavelength which is the target of the experiment equals d and d is the slit separation on our grating sine theta the last bit of information d is given on the diffraction grating it normally says something like 80 lines per millimeter on the diffraction grating and what you need to do is to convert that into a distance so if there's 80 lines per millimeter that means there's a separation of 1 over 80 millimeters so d is 180th times 10 to the minus 3 meters there is other diffraction gratings there's a 300 and there's a 600 probably in your school's kit Again, there's a difference between do you want the largest possible separation, so you get a bigger value of H and therefore more accuracy, or do you prefer to get a range of results and hence plot a graph? So there it is, just summed up on that slide there. So I strongly recommend that you use a graph wherever possible in physics to get whatever value you're after. And although n is a discrete variable, so you can only have orders of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 maybe, you still get greater accuracy by plotting a graph. So because our equation is n lambda equals d sine theta, and we've plotted n on the x-axis and d sine theta on the y-axis, lambda is essentially our m term, our gradient for this graph. I could neaten that up if you like and write d sine theta equals lambda n and that would be in the equation y equals mx or mx plus c with no intercept. To be as accurate as possible we want to make our measurements as large as possible that's the easiest way to be more accurate. If we use a ruler then we have an uncertainty in d of plus or minus one millimeter so the actual uncertainty possible in d is plus or minus one millimeter. So the percentage uncertainty in d is one millimeter over the actual value of d in millimeters. That means that the larger the value of d possible, the lower the percentage uncertainty in this measurement will be. And the lower the percentage uncertainty in this measurement, the lower the overall percentage uncertainty therefore in the angle, and the lower the overall percentage uncertainty in our lambda is going to be as well. Whenever you do a practical in physics, really challenge yourself to get as accurate as you possibly can be. We also want this to be as large as possible and we want as many different orders as we possibly can manage. The greatest accuracy I've ever had with this experiment was when I did it in a sports hall. And we used therefore about 40 meters to be the value of D. And we, although we used a tape measure and the tape measure just had plus or minus one centimeter, we still were able to get much more accuracy in our final value of lambda than we were in the lab with using about somewhere in the region of one meter here and somewhere in the region of 20, 30 centimeters over here. If we use white light, then we wouldn't be able to see those bright spots. We would actually see a spectrum. And so it'd be really difficult to accurately measure the distance between the maxima here. I would definitely recommend you having a go with a simulation before you actually have a go with this practical, because there's quite a lot of maths for you to get your head around. This is the O physics simulation, and I think it's really, really useful. Before I change this, just have a little predict to yourself. Look at the maths, look at the equation, and predict what's going to happen to the pattern if I change this from green to red or from green to blue. So what's going to happen to the actual pattern that you get? What's going to happen to the spacing between those dots if I change the color of the light? Think about this equation and think about what changing lambda, the wavelength of the light, will do to the angle. Think about what changing the wavelength of the light, that's lambda in the equation, will do to the spacing of those dots. Hopefully you got that. The blue of the light, the shorter the wavelength, the closer those dots are together. The red of the light, the further they are apart. So I've taken some data from three different lasers, a red, a green and a blue, and I'm just analysing it here in Excel. And I've converted the number of lines per millimetre into an actual slit separation. I'm doing all those calculations, I've used trigonometry to work out the angle between the zeroth order and all of the different orders that I have on the screen. And then I'm going to work out d sine theta and plot that against n. I'm fully aware that that n is a discrete variable, so it's not brilliant to plot a graph of this, but it is a better idea to get a gradient rather than an arithmetic mean. Gradients are less influenced by anomalies, so it's always better, if possible, to plot a graph. Now I've got my three graphs here, and you can see these are the wavelengths, the gradients of those graphs are actually the wavelengths of the laser light. I'm just converting them into nanometers to show you there. 
I recommend that O physics simulation. I'll put a link to that in the description. It's a really useful way that you can do this practical at home before walking into the lab and actually using the lasers. Do let me know if you want a full explanation of how to use Excel to get this graph. It is worth talking about safety with laser light. You should never point the laser light at somebody. You should be well aware of it and have it nowhere near your eyes. You should also try and use less reflective surfaces so that it doesn't reflect and go into anyone's eyes. A good rule of thumb is to always do these practicals at waist height rather than at eye height so that you're unlikely to reflect that into somebody's eyes. But just be aware of the people around you and make sure that you don't accidentally shine laser light into people's eyes. And remember that the maxima that you actually produce are where waves are doing constructive interference. So they will be more intense than the individual laser light this is a risk in the practical. However, it is very important that you do your own risk assessment and you have that checked out by your teacher before you go ahead and do this practical. Now remember with this, we use lasers because they're monochromatic light, meaning that it's light of all the same frequency and therefore they're coherent. Now a coherent wave is one that has a constant phase relationship. So when we have waves in phase, we get constructive interference. And when we have waves out of phase, pi out of phase, or in antiphase, we get destructive interference. So essentially that's what we're looking at here on our screen. We're looking at points where the waves are lining up in phase because they've traveled multiples of the wavelength path difference and points where they're in antiphase because they've traveled odd multiples of half wavelength path difference and so they have pi phase difference so they're in antiphase if we use white light then we wouldn't be able to spot maxima we would actually have maxima for different colors so we use laser light which is monochromatic we get these one color maximas which are really easy to spot and because they're easy to spot because they have very bright spot maxima rather than bright fringes and rather than spectra we can really accurately determine our lengths in this experiment. Now there is a comparison here between using Young's double slits and diffraction gratings, and they do this in detail in the AQA syllabus. It's a really interesting thing for you to look at as well. Young's double slits produce bright fringes rather than bright spot maxima, and it is not spread out over such a large distance. So we need to find a way of being accurate with much smaller distances, much smaller separation of those bright fringes than our bright spots. More details about the practical then. This is why we use diffraction gratings rather than just use the Young's double slit apparatus. Diffraction gratings give us bright spot maximum, so they're much easier to pinpoint exactly where the maximum are. It's actually the slit width which determines how bright they are. That bright spot maxima allows us to increase our distance, so reduce our percentage uncertainty. So in AQA, they want you to do the actual double slit experiment, which produces this bright fringe pattern rather than the maxima spots. You're going to measure the fringe width and that is going to be quite tricky because they're actually quite narrow and so you're going to have to use a set of vernier calipers to be more accurate with that to increase your accuracy you can measure the whole diffraction pattern and you can divide that by the number of fringes you can see to give you w the one fringe width that you're interested in now the wavelength in this case is equal to w the fringe width multiplied by s the slit separation and that will be recorded on the young slit card that you've got divided by d which is the distance to the screen now what you can do here is you can vary the distance to the screen and then you can get a graph of width versus distance to the screen and the gradient should be lambda over the slit separation it's always useful to find a way to plot a graph to make yourself more accurate so in this case we're trying to reduce our percentage of uncertainty by using calipers which have a uncertainty of plus or minus 0.1 of a millimeter and you're going to measure across the whole interference pattern and then divide that width by the number of fringe widths to give you the width of one with a diffraction gratin, then you get much larger distances, so you can measure that with a ruler or a meter ruler. So you're plus or minus one millimeter, but your actual distance is much longer, so your percentage uncertainty is smaller still. As usual, I would really recommend playing about with a simulation if possible. This is the FETSIM, absolutely the best simulations that are available on the internet. So this is the simulation of the Young's double slits. This is our laser light, you can see it's monochromatic, it's all in phase, it's all the same frequency. And when we say color in physics, we are always talking about the frequency of the light. We're getting this diffraction pattern, these bright fringes here on the screen here. So in this case, you would use a caliper to measure from the top to the bottom, and you'd divide by one, two, three, four, five to give you W, the fringe width. You can change the slit separation, you can change the slit width here as well, and you can vary also the frequency and see how that affects the diffraction pattern that's made on the screen. See what's mad about interference is that this happens also to electrons. So this is something that you cannot explain just with a particle model of an electron. See what's coming next is wave-particle duality.
when you find out that all things can have both wave properties and particle properties. Thanks for watching Gorilla Physics.